I've heard that the data science team at Levi's is big on puns. What are some of your favorites? Yeah, definitely. We have quite a fantastic group of data scientists at Levi's. So one of the first puns we came up with or thought of was uh, to name our tech blog, Machine Learning. Uh, um, another one that is actually in production today is uh, this project where we look at the different attributes that define the look of a gene. So for example, what kind of wash does it have? What kind of damage does it have? What's the, the leg flare? Or what's the, the rise of the gene for different types of genes? And how those attributes can then be combined to create a final look. And we call that project genome, uh, just like the way the genome often defines the structure of an entity uh, in some ways. So data scientists come from many different career paths. What are some of the most interesting career transitions you've seen people make into the field? My team that I uh, manage today, I think, is a, is a great uh, example of uh, fairly unconventional transitions in data science. So one of our data scientists uh, actually has a PhD in philosophy and used to be a professor, and then went through a boot camp and became a data scientist. Um, another one, um, she actually had a graduate business degree and then transition to data science after a few years of uh, doing business analytics type of work. Um, another one, uh, which I think might be the most unconventional of the lot, he dropped out of school and uh, played professional poker for six years and then went through a boot camp and became a data scientist. And then uh, my previous manager actually used to be a lawyer before he became a data scientist. Um, and so there's quite a few unconventional uh, paths that lead to data science, even within my team. What skills or traits do you look for when hiring data scientists? Data science is as much about the skill sets as it about the mindsets. And the interesting thing about the skill sets is that they can often be taught, but the mindsets have to often be learned. I think one of the key things that I personally look for are people who have a keen focus on the consumer experience that is, or the end user experience that's created by their algorithms, um, and not necessarily how like cool or research or cutting edge the algorithm itself is. Um, so Steve Jobs actually has, this, has a quote, which was, um, you have to start with the consumer experience and then ba work backwards with the technology. And I think, which is like very appreciative when you think about how a lot of people who come into data science from research labs or from being Kaggle grandmasters focus a lot of their time and energy on um, the accuracy of the models or the cleanliness of the data, but not necessarily on what would a human feel when they are receiving the output of this algorithm. And, and so really starting from that, from the place of what is the end user experience and then working backwards through what kinds of technologies do we have today that can solve this problem um, for the end user. You believe that there are five data science mindsets. Could you share what they are? In terms of the first mindset, um, I would say it's, it's a lot of it's around that, the fact that data scientists, our core value proposition is really in enabling better decisions, whether they are made through an algorithm or whether they're made through something that is delivered to a human decision maker who then makes a decision, the core value proposition we bring to a company is that through our work, we will help the company make better decisions across the board. And it's really important for data scientists to uh, create good decision aids for decision makers whenever possible by uh, leveraging data in a very scientific and rigorous way. It's a lot like uncovering the laws of nature as to how do people behave, how do certain quantities fluctuate when other quantities fluctuate, things of that nature, and bringing it all together so that the, the final decision maker, whether that's an algorithm or a human being, has the right tools to make the right call at the right time. The next one would be, does the candidate have a, a, a good BS filter? And a BS filter, and BS here could stand for uh, bad science or bias statistics or more conventional uh, definition of the term, um, but are they really a critical thinker? Data science is going through an interesting time right now where we have this perfect storm brewing in many ways. On one hand, you have companies who are claiming at unprecedented rates in earnings calls that they're using AI and machine learning to make their businesses more efficient. On the other hand, you have startups who just by adding .ai in their domain name stand to raise three and a half times more money than companies that don't. And so it's this perfect storm in, in some ways. And if you're a data scientist who's really you know, working in this field, and trying to understand which companies out there are actually leveraging machine learning to solve real business problems, or which software providers are really uh, developing a lot of thought into how to develop solutions that solve real business problems. It can often be tricky to navigate that, that entire uh, spectrum 
uh, of companies out there. And if that weren't enough, our jobs themselves have this interesting nature to them where Cassie Kozirkov actually uh, said in a, in, a, in, a, in a blog once that data analysis is the ultimate Rorschach test, that humans are so prone to apophenia where we will find patterns in randomness that we can often find meaning in data that doesn't actually have any meaning to it in, in general. And it's important to like not fool ourselves and to be able to um, understand that oftentimes results that look too good to be true are not true. And that if there's an extraordinary claim that's being made, that, it, that has to be backed by extraordinary evidence, even if that's a claim that we are making based on the data. And so it's important to keep ourselves honest and to have a good BS filter for things that we are doing and to have good sanity checks for uh, our work itself. And um, uh, uh, Richard Feynman actually once famously said, uh, uh, that the first principle is to not fool yourself because you're the easiest person to fool. And I think as data scientists, we are so excited to bring our work to the world that we sometimes don't uh, pass it through some of the sanity filters and it's important to pass everything through the sanity filter. The third mindset is having uh, the ability to think like a lawyer where it's not necessarily around you know practicing law necessarily, but a lot of it is about how can we take a, a statement and take it apart and remove all the subjective components of it and really keep the objective core of the statement so that it is tangible and measurable. And the way it applies to the work that we do as data scientists is in the fact that a lot of times business stakeholders will come to us with a fairly um, simple ask, which to a human being makes a lot of sense, but when you think about how do we translate that to a machine can be often very challenging. So things like, you know, we want to make our consumers more loyal. We want to detect fraud. Now, for you and I, we can we have our own ideas of what loyal means and what fraud means. But how would do? How do we explain that to a machine? How does a machine learn to actually uh, identify loyalty or fraud, fraudulent behavior? And those are things that are very important skills for data scientists to have. Where um, what lawyers are really great at doing is that they are really good at using very precise language to uh, really cut out the, the boundary of the playing field because otherwise the problem statements can become too challenging and too broad for us to solve in a meaningful way. A lot of disconnect happens is when the business wants to solve one problem versus data scientists solving a, a different interpretation of that problem. And so I think it's important for both parties to be super aligned around what is the exact definition of the problem that we're trying to solve and is that something that we can solve using machine learning even, right? And so I think just understanding that and drawing those boundaries. There's this famous quote which is, uh, uh, a problem well defined is a problem half solved. So I think spending more time upfront in solving, defining the problem before jumping directly on the solution is important. As a, is an important mindset. The fourth mindset is to have a keen eye on the consumer experience, and really where it comes from is the fact that as data scientists, we often tend to be so enamored by technology that we often forget that there there are many times there's a human who, who's being affected by the outcome of our algorithms, even if it's something you know very simple like you know, a recommendation that we might provide. I think there are stories around, uh, you know, algorithms being trained for some objective which is not aligned with what the, the users necessarily want. And so I think it's very important to have uh, a keen eye on what kind of consumer experience is being enabled through the application of this algorithm. And the fifth mindset is really around that data science is, a, is truly a team sport and that in most business contexts, uh, a data scientist can never be truly effective if they work in a silo. So a lot of data scientists I meet come from academia, research labs, or they used to be Kaggle grandmasters where they were often a team of one um, and they operated as such. And when they come to work in companies, they, what they realize is that a lot of times what they're working on is just one small part of the overall problem. Uh, and so the analogy I like to use there is that they might be working on the car's engine, but for the car to actually go to market, there's a lot of other components to it, like the transmission, like uh, the seat belts, like uh, the, the audio visual system, things of that nature. And it's important for data scientists to be able to speak the language of their interdisciplinary partners from operations and finance and DevOps and product management and project management, and to really be able to um, understand how, they, how their work can fit in to solve a larger problem. So I think having, that, having a, a team mindset is very important uh, as a data scientist. So now you're at Levi's. What are some of the biggest problems that your team is tackling? The cool thing for us is that we pretty much have like a broad mandate to transform the company from its traditional ways of working as an enterprise to a more data-driven enterprise. And so there's very little that's off the table for us. And the opportunities are, and the problem spaces are quite wide and diverse. 
Uh, the two broad categories that I would classify them under are the first one being uh, personalizing our customer experience and making that journey delightful for our consumers at, at every touch point and every channel that they interact with the brand. And the other one being making our business processes more efficient by the use of data-driven decision making. So under the uh, customer journey personalization, we have a number of initiatives, a number of problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, one of them being, how do we make the online shopping experience as delightful as the in-store shopping experience? So we train our store stylists to be very knowledgeable of the products and being very good at providing help and information to our uh, consumers when they walk into a store and looking for help. And that's been one of the key areas where we're trying to replicate that experience online, where uh, our, our consumers who are shopping online, browsing online, when they see the variety of products and the different fit numbers, for example, 501s, 511, 711, 715, uh, that they can actually make sense of it and they don't feel overwhelmed and can actually find the right information at the right time. And so, for example, to solve that problem, we have built uh, recommender systems. We have, have, we have a chatbot on the website that can help provide advice when needed. And uh, we're also trying to find ways to constantly um, uh, marry together the disparate data sources that we have from a consumer. So for example, their browsing history, their shopping history, their email uh, interaction history, um, while obviously in, in, you know, ensuring that data privacy laws are, 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 you know, are met and like customers' data is like, treated very uh, carefully and you know, treading the boundary between the cool versus creepy when it comes to personalization. Um, and having uh, at every touch point, like really bringing out the brand voice and not just you know, focusing on, let's say, who this person is, but really what they want. Um, so one of the ways that we incorporate that on the website is by uh, defining our objective functions in ways that really optimize for, is this tool or solution helping the consumer get to the next step of their journey versus optimizing for things like, product views or click-through rates or AOVs, for example. Um, so it's a very consumer-focused uh, lens that we take at solving those problems. On the uh, optimizing business processes, there's, qu again, quite a number of problems there. But I think some of the key uh, I think problems that we solve are using forecasting models. So we have one model that forecasts uh, product returns, for example. So how many products and of what type are going to return to one of our warehouses? Um, other forecasts that we create are uh, very granular uh, site traffic forecasts so that you know during events like Black Friday and Cyber Monday when traffic really goes to the roof uh, that we have enough server capacity so that when you know people are you know coming to buy products for their loved ones or for themselves they don't run up against uh, 503 or 404 errors on the website you know saying that oh you know we can't serve this request for example what are some of the interesting ab tests that your team has run our data scientist was actually looking through the website funnel and what she noticed was that uh, a lot of people are abandoning their carts very close to the checkout uh, stage. And uh, what she noticed was that because Levi.com doesn't offer free shipping every day of the year, that on the days of the year that it does have a, a free shipping threshold of $100, uh, people will add items to their cart, to their cart and then they'll notice that they're you know, $10, $20 away from free shipping and they will um, then don't want, they don't want to pay that $750 for, for the, to get to the free shipping threshold and hence they abandoned their cart. So what she came up with was this algorithm that was uh, powering a recommendation engine that would um, recommend products that would help uh, the, the user get over the free shipping threshold while still being complementary to some of the items that they've added to cart. So for example, if somebody's $15 away from free shipping, which was 100 bucks, let's say, they it would show them um, you know, tops or accessories uh, that would help them get over the free shipping threshold. And so what we noticed was that after we implemented that feature, uh, we saw a pretty s steep increase in uh, customers continuing the checkout. And then what we also noticed was that uh, people are now buying a, a larger variety of products from us, where I think a lot of people who came to the website thinking that Levi's only sells jeans were able to discover new types of products as well. 